what's the skill that's required for this job that most people don't know about? It was not, it wasn't always exactly what you would expect. You know, you think, oh, I'm going to go work and just hang around with comic books all day. With me today is Rick Akers, a professional in comic books in every way. He's worked with comics since the early 90s and is now a consignment director at Heritage Auctions. You're going to hear some behind the curtains information about the comic book business from Rick. And then we'll talk about his specific passions and interests. So, Rick, how did you get the job of consignment director at Heritage? I got into comic books years ago, back in the early 90s, which actually by that time I was already in my early 20s. Uh, and then I was away from comic books for uh, you know 20, about 20 years. And I decided I was going to get back into comic books. And my wife told me that she would prefer that I not spend any of our money to do so. So, <laughs> so at that point, I ended up uh, pulling some of my old comic books from the basement and I sold them on eBay. I started selling on eBay and uh, pretty regularly. And then I got to know someone on eBay, um, Roger, Roger66. And he told me about the uh, CGC boards. So then I got onto the CGC boards, which was a whole new world. I don't think I would be here today if it weren't for getting that kind of community uh, with the CGC boards. And got to know those people, began buying and selling and buying and selling and buying and selling, and also continuing to sell occasionally on eBay, then starting to sell on Heritage and the other auction houses. And then Jim Halperin became aware of me. And mm. so um, through his son, Mikey, too. I knew Mikey, uh, did was involved with him in some shows. And Jim contacted me and he said, hey, you know, I've heard good things about you. Um, and I know we, you know, I, I've bought a few things from you. We would like to um, have you come down and I might have a mission for you to, to take on in your life. And I said, well, I do have a business. <laughs> that I've had for over 20 years. I, I have a home, I, I, you know, I, I've got a pretty established life. He said, well, just you and your wife come down to Dallas and, and meet with me and my team. And so uh, they flew me down and, and my wife down and we discussed everything. And I decided with my wife's okay, she was on board. We sold the business, sold our house. You know, I began to work from Ohio. And then after about a year of cleaning all everything up in Ohio, Moved down to Dallas, and uh, it's been uh, it's been f about four years and three months that I've been with Heritage altogether, and three years and three months in in Dallas. So that's uh, that's how it all all happened. So you said Jim Halperin sort of looked at what you were doing and was impressed. Can you speak more about that? What were the things that you were doing that Jim was like? Yeah, we need to have that guy on our team at Heritage. You know, I just I connected well with people. Uh, people people spoke well about their interactions with me. You know, when I would sell things on the boards, I feel like um, I developed a pretty good reputation there for the most part. I also think that having a business background, mm. you know, in my family, I think helped. You know, my business had been in electric signs and there was a lot of struggles with that, you know, with having to deal with uh, manufacturing and installation and, and crane trucks and city permits and ordinances and lots of juggling parts and uh so getting into comics felt like a like a, a step in the right direction for me so relatedly what's the skill that's required for this job that most people don't know about it was not it wasn't always exactly what you would expect you know you think oh i'm gonna go work and just hang around with comic books all day and you know it's just gonna be so great and that's part of it there is some of that but there's also a lot of um uh project management i would say that um the role, you know, it's, it's not only are you working with consigners to bring in consignments, but you, you, you really, it's on you to make sure that everything's running smoothly, you know, from shipping, receiving, input, grading, auction placement, auction marketing. Now, granted, you know, I'm not doing all of those things. You know, there are other people on our team. You know, there's easily 50 plus people working just in comics. So we have a great team that does this, but Ultimately, I'm responsible to the consigner for that process. I don't feel I'm responsible to the consigner necessarily for the result because the market will speak for the result. You know, you know. So I, I don't. I think sometimes a consignment director can get too much praise if things are great and too much blame if things don't go the way you wanted them to. But I think in terms of you know making sure we do the best we can to with all the logistics, I think the project management side 
uh, of the position is um, was you know is something that I was well suited for because of my past experience with my business. There was a lot of that, but it was um, more than I was expecting in that area, and more than I think most people would think there would be. Some of the great moments that happen are when you're uh, called out to meet with a client who really uh, perhaps they've inherited this or 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 they're in a or in kind of a rough financial situation there's something where this experience of consigning with heritage is going to positively change their life mm -hmm. and there that that's an extremely rewarding position so the human side of this is really the part that i i find the most rewarding i mean it's great to be able to hold an action comics number one or a detective 27 or see amazing pieces of artwork come through all of that still can give me goosebumps but the thing that really warms my heart is when i'm meeting with uh someone and they didn't realize that what they have here is is life-changing and then we're able to take that and um and bring that to the market the market responds incredibly well, and then that just changes those people's lives for the better. Yeah, speaking of going and seeing some of these collections for the first time, is there any book that you saw that you just sort of took a step back and you're like, I can't believe I'm actually seeing this or holding this? I, I love comics, and I still love comics, but I feel like I've seen a lot of comics, and whenever I see an original piece of artwork that I hadn't seen before, that... That, 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 that gets me quite a bit. And so recently we had the incredible uh, Alex Raymond Flash Gordon uh, Sunday that was kind of like you saw, um, you know, uh, kind of a basis for the thought of Princess Leia's look. Mm -hmm. and, and when that came in, I mean, Alex Raymond, first of all, is just ridiculous. To me, I, I find him to be, he's the person that all these other people were looking up to and wanting to be. And so when I saw that and I held, actually held that in my hand, and I took a picture of myself with it. You know, <laughs> sometimes I still do have like, hey, hey, take a picture of me, you know? Rick, what advice do you give to someone who is consigning to auction? So here, here's some pieces of advice. I would say that um, it's a good idea to consign at least 20 lots if you can. You know, if someone comes and they just say, oh, I'm going to test you out. Here's three books. You know, or here's four books, or here's one book. You're not giving the market enough chance to to even out. You know, my experience consigning myself and what I've seen overall is that if you have 20 books, there's going to be three or four books that might disappoint you, that might go for less than you were expecting by by a pretty decent margin. So you might have a book in there that you were thinking, ah, oh, you know, I, I spent $500 on this book and it only went for you know. 350 oh my goodness you know and, and there's there's gonna be you know 13 14 books that are kind of like right around where you're expecting give or take 10 percent. they're really close and then if you have enough variety of books and enough of a group there's usually two three four books that really blow you away and that's that's so so those end up evening all the margins out to where you end up being you, you have to look at it as a whole picture if you're someone who looks at each individual item and goes, I paid $150 for that. And if that doesn't go for at least $150, I'm going to be so upset. Well, then maybe that's not the way you need to look at it. And maybe you need to look and go, okay, here's a group of 20 <laughs> things that I think should be around $5,000. And you know what? Really good chance you're going to get there or break that because of the two or three things that do really well. But you've got to be able to emotionally handle the two or three things that aren't going to do as well. Because, the you know, ultimately, auction is really true market value, you know, especially with Heritage, because we have 1.75 million registered bidders. Mm. So we have a really broad spectrum of buyers, and they represent some of the most well-heeled buyers as, you know, in, the, in the market. And so you're going to see what your stuff really goes for. Sometimes you were the one who loved your stuff the most. You know, I know that I've been that person, but you know what? If you, if you spread, if you have a, if you, the more you can sign, the better your chances of having some real outliers. I had a book that I had up for sale on the CGC boards and I had it on the boards for $1,200. It had been up there for 
a week. And then I think I reduced it to like 1100, you know, just hoping for somebody to offer me a thousand dollars at least, you know? And I think I had paid like around a thousand dollars for the book. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, nobody's buying this book. And it was a really cool book. It was a cool MLJ, you know, it was a good one. Uh, and a zip 18, I think. And so then I was like, okay, well, I took these books and it was one of the books I sent in consignment uh, to Heritage. And here it goes, you know, for at Heritage for uh, $3,200. Mm. You know? I mean, and that happens fairly frequently. So, so one more piece of advice to consigners and to the general comic public is that I, I was around the CGC boards a lot, but well before I even was involved in Instagram or anything like that. And there's a community around the CGC boards. There's a community around Instagram. There's a community around Facebook. There's a community around YouTube. There's a community around Discord, you know, all these different areas. And what can happen at times is you begin to feel like um, th this insular community is the greater comic book world. It's not, it's a lot bigger. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 that's, that was one of the biggest surprises I found in coming to Heritage is because your your brain kind of tricks you. And here's what happens uh, from what I've seen. Let's say there's a signature auction and there and, and you look on all your friends on Instagram, or your friends on the boards, and they start posting things they bought. And you're like, oh, oh, there's that guy who bought that. Oh, oh, that's where that went. Oh, that's where that went. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, you you know, you maybe have pulled 20 or 30 items from people you know where you're like, oh, that's where this stuff went. And you begin to you go, man. Wow, we're buying up everything. There were fifteen hundred items, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, so like, okay, so you just, we just, we just saw that the people in our community bought two or three percent. That that's probably pretty reflective of how large the actual buying community is. It's much bigger with a lot more outside buyers who aren't even involved in any form of social media, more, more than people would think. And so my point about that as a consigner is don't think that whatever venue you're using now has has full reach. You know, Heritage has a much bigger reach. What, one more thing I would say just in general to consigners, especially to uh, the what I call the delector community, you know, uh, I, I, I've been a delector for sure, you know, kind of like a semi like partial dealer, mostly collector kind of person. You know, you're building up your own collection through buying and selling and all that kind of stuff. Is that um, I see a lot of people who say, okay, I've got these books I'm wanting to sell. And so I've, uh, I'm have i gonna go sell them out on Instagram or I'm gonna go sell them out on whatever method I wanna choose to sell them because I feel more comfortable being able to say, okay, this book is gonna be $600 and somebody gave you six hundred dollars. Yes, that's great. You know, and so you might have fifty books that you're wanting to sell, and you sell ten of them at the price you wanted, or or pretty close to the price you wanted. And the forty that are left that nobody wanted to pay the price you wanted are the ones you go, "Hey, Rick, here you go." And that's fine. We'll take them and we'll get them out to market. We're we're all for that. But sometimes I wonder if you might have left something on the table with those 10 that you priced out that snapped up. And so what you're left with giving us are the 40 that didn't sell for what you wanted them to sell for. So, you know, if we get close to what you wanted to sell for we're, or, or better, then we're, we're pretty crushing it. But some of your real outliers that could have went crazy might be some of the ones that you, you sold. So that's one more thing I would just put out there. All right, Rick, let's move from comic as your job the comics as your passion. Mm -hmm. So what is the book that brings you the most joy when you hold it in your hands? Wow. Well, if you if you know my story or have seen me around, you know that a lot of things pass through my hands. Okay. Uh, and I, I, I remember when I was in comics in the early 90s, the one book I really wanted so badly was Suspense 3. And I could just, I never could get one. Like back then there used to be this weekly little newspaper that would come out. It was kind of, I don't remember it was comic book news or comic book weekly or whatever it was called. I can't even remember anymore. It's a little newspaper. 
and it would come out every week. And, and I managed a comic book store and I would get that newsletter. And I looked through there one week and there was a suspense three and VG minus for three hundred and fifty dollars. And I like I, I mean, and I, I got it like at eleven at night and I'm like calling, leaving messages, you know, hey, I'll take it, I'll take it. <laughs> I, I even I even sent a letter by snail mail the next day. I will take it. Please let me know where, does, you know, I'll get you a check. And of course, it had already sold because by the time they actually got those out, most of the time, those kinds of things had already sold at a convention or whatever. And so finally, uh, I don't know, 10 years, eight, no, seven, eight years ago, I finally got a Suspense 3. Of course, I don't have it now, but that was a really exciting, exciting moment. Um, other books that I still have that really, every time I hold them, I'm like, oh man, uh, Planet Comics 65. You know, I just love Planet Comics 65. Uh, for some reason, Tales of Suspense 8 with Monstro on the cover, that 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 octopus cover. I just, I, I have a 7.5 of that. And I just, I, I've had that book for a, a long time. For me, having a book for like six, seven years is a long time. And I've had that book and I just, I love looking at it. Um, I like, I love Weird Science 16. You know, the one with like the kind of Mars Attacks guys and the kids. And Teenage Romance is 45. A real, real rare Matt Baker yellow background cover. I I love that one. And then I, I, you asked for one, but I, I, it's hard. <laughs> and then my last one is, and this is one that probably very few people would feel this way about. But every time I have the highest graded copy, and I used to have the second highest graded copy too, of Tip Topper Number One. Hmm. Tip Topper Number One is this great classic Ernie Bushmiller cover. Uh, and it's, uh, I have a 9.2 of it. Many viewers of this channel have their own comic book sub niche, and I know you do as well. Would you mind sharing yours, Rick? Yeah. Yeah. I I've had, I've had kind of different little dark corridors, you know, uh, some of them not so dark, you know, I, I think that, I mean, obviously I wouldn't call this a niche, but I mean, who doesn't, you know, amazing Spider-Man, you know, is. I love Spider-Man. I, I think it started with Electric Company when I was a kid, you know, watching watching that. But from a niche standpoint, uh, Planet Comics and, and basically atomic science fiction, atomic age science fiction books. I just think they're so cool. I really like those. I, you know, I, I actually prefer some of the late 40s and early 50s uh, science fiction stuff. I liked where that was headed. So um, a lot of Maurice Whitman covers, pulp magazines. I've kind of you know, you've been down that corridor. I had a really good pulp collection for a while. I still have some great pulps that I love. I think pulps are awesome. And so Matt Baker, uh, I think is just absolute genius. I've got some pretty cool Matt Baker stuff. I, I have something worth bringing to the camera, I think. Let's do it. All right, just one second. Yeah, this is one of my, one of my real uh, prized possessions this is matt baker's first uh first published professional artwork oh my for, god he did uh he illustrated uh cinderella for uh ruth roche did a uh version of cinderella and this is her you know putting on the slipper and so this is um actually you know hand done hand colored by matt baker and um it's not for sale and I love it and I'm going to, I'm going to get it framed. And so, so I, I have, I have some other Matt Baker artwork as well, but, but this one just really uh, it's special to me for sure. Well, you were able to give up your suspense three. So maybe that'll uh, one day hit the market too. <laughs> maybe I hope not. <laughs> what suggestions do you have for viewers trying to build a collection they love? If you are, someone who has the free and clear funds without going into debt or 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 hampering your lifestyle too much to where you can just go i like it i love it i want it i bought it you know if that's you then you know i i i'm happy for you and i applaud you and i think you should just go ahead and just do that but if you're like most of us where you don't have unlimited funds and you need to go ahead and and you've got to kind of build your way up into your collection. Um, 
I think I think what I would do is I would probably go through the heritage archives because we have an unbelievable amount of stuff you can look through and you can search through the past sales and you can filter to look at golden age or silver age you can filter to look at like what type of genre you're interested in you know romance superhero etc i would look through that or i would do what i did which was i looked through the uh, gerber photo journals like so many of us and i would just go through and, and and look through there and get a feeling for what what hits you you know like you know, if Catman comics, for instance, is what it, which I mean, is awesome. If you look at Catman, you're like, oh my gosh, Catman is so dang cool, and 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 those Quinlan covers and and, and Cole covers. I just I gotta have Catman. Um, then you know, good luck. You know, you know, go go down that path. Be like Keston and recognize that it's gonna take some time to build that. You know, that that having some patience is somewhat important. Because, you know, uh, if you don't have unlimited funds, you know, I've always tried to buy as close to what I felt was a liquid price as possible if I knew that that was not my final copy of something. Um, so I think, you know, learning what you like, being able to look through and do a little bit of research through what kind of genre or era speaks to you is super important. And, um, you know, you might be drawn to the... Uh, the birth of Marvel Comics. You might love Stan Lee's, you know, writing in Ditko's art, or Matt Baker, or Atlas Monster, or LB Cole with his pre-psychedelic covers. Like I could literally just decide, oh man, LB Cole is you know amazing and like make my whole entire interest about LB Cole if I wanted to. Um so I think that uh being able to, you know, know what speaks to you and then build that up. I think is important. I would also, I'd also suggest, you know, like looking for um, copies, you know, if you're looking at books, look for books that have good color saturation. You know, that's, I think that's, I think especially with golden age comics, that's a really key element. Like if you had to ask me, would I rather have a 6.0 um, kind of washed out copy or a 4.5 with good color saturation, I'm, I'm gonna. I want the color, you know. And I think that there's a lot of people in my my uh, thinking with that. So those would be some some of my advices. You know, pick your niche and go there. All right, Rick. Is there anything else you would like to share with our viewers? Well, I just you know want to thank you, Keston, for giving me this time to talk to you and to you your 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 fan base, and just to you know, let you guys know that. Um, I, I'm I'm here at Heritage. If you ever need any, you know, just want to talk about comic books or have any um, anything you might want to consign or or uh, or we do purchase comic books as well when people want to sell out collections. But uh, I think overall, I think that this 2024 is going to be a great year, uh, and I think that anybody who is in this hobby and having fun and enjoying it and not taking it too seriously. And not getting in debt over it i think you know you guys you know just keep having fun I, I don't think this is going anywhere i think i think there's a lot of interest out there in in this part of american history thank you so much rick and rick is surrounded by other great folks at heritage in fact one of his colleagues sold a 3.6 million dollar book you can hear about that story straight from barry sandoval's mouth here thanks so much for watching and hope to see you around Real soon.